This is Israel from the outside. A booming high-tech economy, GDP per capita higher than Germany, more startups than anywhere else outside of Silicon Valley, and a country famous as the startup nation. In seven decades of its existence, Israel went from a war-torn, cash-strapped small piece of desert into a global center of tech innovation, in an incredible story of forging an economic miracle out of nothing. But this story that Israel is so proud of is leaving out some pretty important facts. Because at a closer look, Israel's economy suddenly doesn't look that great. And the country is facing some pretty dire problems that are making its future look kind of grim. So what is the story of Israel's economic success? What's being left out of it? And why its days of glory might be soon over? This is the dark side of Israel's economic miracle. It might sound surprising, but Israel's economic miracle is actually very, very recent. And for most of its short history, the country known today as an economic powerhouse was everything but that. Immediately after Israel was officially established, it was attacked by a League of Arab States. And even though it survived, after 10 months of war, much of the country and the economy was destroyed. And even though Israel won, it was still surrounded by hostile states. It needed to take in millions of incoming Jewish refugees, and it had no natural resources that could help it succeed. What followed was a deep economic crisis, and Israel managed to survive mostly thanks to donations from the American Jewish community, West German reparations, and later the US financial aid. And while throughout the rest of the 20th century, Israel's economy did grow, it wasn't miraculous in any way. And it was nowhere near the growth experienced by Asian economies like South Korea or Japan that started at a similar point. In fact, throughout the 70s and the 80s, Israel came close to a hyperinflation and barely avoided a complete economic collapse. But then in the new century, things started to turn around. In the 2000s, foreign capital started flowing into Israel like crazy. Tech companies with global ambitions started popping up one after another, and Israel's growth finally really took off. So what happened? Well, there are a few things that can explain that. First, in the early 1990s, the USSR fell apart and the Soviet Jews, who were now able to leave, started moving to Israel. Its population grew by almost 20% and many of the new immigrants were highly educated, meaning that Israel's economy suddenly received a stimulus in the form of hundreds of thousands of Soviet engineers and scientists, exactly the kind of boost it needed. Second, Israel was now able to spend way less money on defense and more in other areas. In the 1970s, Israel was spending more than 30% of its GDP on defense and military, twice as much as the Soviet Union and four times more than the US. But as its security situation became more stabilized, its military budget started to go down and the country was able to invest more in other areas important for economic growth, like education, research and infrastructure. Or launch a massive state-owned venture capital fund that helped to finance some of the very first Israeli startups. And finally, in the 90s, Israel underwent a complete transformation of its economic model. It might seem surprising, but for decades, Israel was basically a socialist country, and the state was controlling the economy with interventions, state-owned companies, huge numbers of state employees, and generous welfare benefits. But after going to the edge of bankruptcy in the 1980s, that all had to change. Israel started privatizing state companies, slashing its public sector, removing government regulations and influence of unions. And within a few years, it completely transformed itself and became a liberal capitalist state fully integrated in the global economy. And from the end of the millennium onwards, all these steps started to get results. Today, Israel has the 13th highest GDP per capita in the world, more startups per capita than anyone else, and a reputation as an economic superstar with a model that many other countries are trying to emulate. But while these successes are extremely impressive, the story of Israel's economy is a little more complicated. And when you start to take it apart, it looks a lot less pretty. So let's take a look. 
There's this interesting paradox when it comes to Israel's economy. Because while the country has one of the most educated and hardworking populations in the world that produces an enormous amount of successful high-tech companies, this doesn't really translate into an economy that would benefit this population. And weirdly enough, in many ways, Israel is actually behind many countries that look up to it. To understand what I mean, look at this. Israel has the 13th highest nominal GDP per capita in the world. But when we take a look at the GDP per capita at purchasing power parity, basically GDP adjusted for the cost of living, Israel is suddenly in a much less impressive 30th place. The reason is that Israel is literally the most expensive country in the world to live in. And Tel Aviv, where most of the tech companies are, is the world's most expensive city. And so while Israel has a decent GDP per capita, when it comes to how much you can actually buy for how much you make, it's not great. And it's not just that it's so expensive, but despite having an extremely hardworking and educated population and the largest tech sector relative to the economy in the world, Israel has pretty low wages. Average wage in Israel is at a similar level to European countries like Italy or even Spain, who are known to have pretty bad productivity and outdated economies. Israelis who objectively work much much harder and their economy is based on technology should just make more, but for for some reason, they do not. But why is that? Well, this is where the story of the Israeli economic miracle kind of starts to fall apart. The thing is that while Israel is known as the startup nation, this actually only applies to a very small part of the country. Even though the tech sector makes up a big part of the economy, almost 20% of its GDP, it only makes up about 8% of the jobs. And while the 8% are generally paid pretty well, the remaining 92% of jobs are not, and are often low paid and low qualified. Today, the average salary in tech is almost three times higher than in any other sector, and the disparity keeps growing. But while this is great for the 10% of the highly qualified tech employees, the result is that 90% of the society is not really part of the tech miracle in any way. Most people have salaries below the average of Western Europe and way below the average of the US, but they still live in the world's most expensive country. And so, unsurprisingly, Israel has one of the highest levels of inequality on the planet. And there's another issue with having one sector so far ahead of every other part of the economy. Because if that one goes away, the whole country is in real trouble, like a plane flying on a single engine. And well, that might be already happening. Because right now, Israel is facing some major challenges that might cause irreparable damage to its tech sector and take down the entire Israeli miracle and the whole economy along with it. But to look at what can go wrong with putting all your eggs in one basket, you don't have to go to Israel. Even in the most advanced economies, markets can go down, bubbles can pop, and inflation can go up, and no investment can guarantee anything. But there is one asset class that has held value for generations despite the ups and downs of economic cycles, contemporary art. And the sponsor of this video, Masterworks, is giving you access to this opportunity. For the last 27 years, high-quality contemporary art has outpaced the S&P 500 by 136%. And while, for the sake of transparency, I haven't started investing with Masterworks yet myself, they have delivered over 45 million in net returns to everyday investors. So far, there have been 16 exits with 16 positive returns in a row, and over 800,000 people have signed up. So if you want to try, you can sign up using the link in the description, skip the waitlist, and get started today. And now, back to the video. The first major problem for the future of Israel's miracle is that the country is extremely divided. So much that 60% of the citizens are worried about the possibility of a civil war. In the past nine months, the country has been going through an unprecedented domestic political crisis with an intensity that Israel has never really experienced before. On one hand, the crisis is about a judicial reform proposed by the current government that, according to the opposition, might undermine Israel 
Israeli democracy. But underneath that, there is even a deeper struggle over what Israel should look like and whether it should be a modern, secular, liberal democracy or a highly nationalistic and a religiously conservative state. And while this division has always been there, it's increasingly tearing Israeli society apart. And this time, the politics have very real economic consequences. The thing is that the people who oppose the current government and its actions tend to be the ones who drive the economy the most. Engineers, scientists, startup founders, and IT workers are worried about what the country might look like in the future. And investors, who provide the necessary venture capital, are worried about political instability. According to a survey from July 2023, 70% of Israeli startups have taken steps to relocate outside of Israel. And venture funding in the country has dropped by 67% since the start of the political crisis. And if this trend continues, the startup ecosystem might never recover. But even if the current crisis calms down, the long-term outlook doesn't look great either. Because the crisis highlights another major issue, a demographic one, and one that's only gonna get more visible. The thing is that there is a significant part of the Israeli society that's the exact opposite of a startup nation. The Orthodox Jewish community, the Haredim. They enjoy quite privileged treatment from the government. They are exempted from the military service. Only half of all ultra-Orthodox men participates in the workforce, and the other half lives off of government stipends instead. And their children usually don't learn mainstream subjects like math or science, and instead focus on religious education. Today, the Haredim make up 13% of the population, but they tend to marry early and have a lot more children than the average, and so they are quickly becoming more and more populous and are expected to make up 25% of the population in 2050. And whatever you think of the religion, it's probably not gonna be good for the economy. Israel, where a quarter of the population doesn't serve in the military, isn't integrated in the job market, and lacks a secular education, is gonna have an increasingly hard time to remain the same country as today. And the growing number of the ultra-Orthodox Jews will further heighten the division and intensify the battle over the character of the country. And although Israel has a good track record of overcoming impossible challenges, this one is gonna be really tricky. 